Hey everybody, welcome to Internet's best IELTS crash course. We're going to be done with it in one hour covering all four modules. You're going to learn tips and tricks, resources, where you can find them, and a lot of information that you need to understand the examiner marking criteria. We're going to discuss every single type of question. It's going to be magical because we're going to finish it within one hour and you are going to learn so much after this. Once you finish this video, your band mark is definitely going to increase by one to two bands easily. So let's get into it. We're going to start with writing and this video is for general IELTS. We're not covering academic. We will cover that later. So please subscribe if you haven't already. In the general writing, that's where people fail all the time. That's where we hear horror stories of people getting 8 and 8.5 and everything, but writing, they always end up getting 6.5. The jump from 6.5 to 7 is just impossible to make for a lot of people who are stuck there for many years. Now, if you use templates, if you use AIDSET Education's patented templates, you are guaranteed a score of 7.5, 8 or more. And we're going to look at these templates right now, and you're going to understand why this happens. Templates are basically copy paste words. These words right here that you can memorize, use them as they are in the exam and all our students by using them get wonderful scores. What they do is they provide you words and phrases that are mistake proof. They're highly advanced in terms of vocabulary and phrases. They have a range as well. They're designed that way. So it ensures that you get great marks in those sentences and phrases that you use. It also saves you a lot of time in the exam because you don't have to think, you just copy paste the stuff and fill in the rest of the details. So we're gonna look at two types of questions in task one, informal and formal letter writing. In the informal letters, you are talking to a friend or family. Remember that, friend or family, if you get that question, it's informal and you would follow the informal template. If you are talking to a formal person, it's gonna be anyone who is not your friend or family. This is a confusion because a lot of times you would get a neighbor. Now, a neighbor is semi-formal, but semi-formal does not exist in IELTS. It's a big confusion. You don't need a third template for that. If your neighbor is mentioned in the question as a friend or family, he or she will be informal. If not, you're not on speaking terms or you just don't know each other. It's going to be formal. Got it? Great. Now let's go and look at the informal template. You can read the question. Again, this is a one hour crash course. It will be a little fast. So you can pause the video at times where you want to read my screen. In this case, you can see the informal letter question says, an English speaking friend is coming to visit your town and there are three bullet points, which they usually are. You can read the question again, pause the video if you would like. The template gives you the first paragraph and the last paragraph. So the first paragraph says, hopefully, so there's a Lee. Lee's are adverbs. The more adverbs you use, the more marks you get because people rarely use them and you will score more if you use a range of vocabulary. Hopefully you and your husband are doing well. My apologies for not being in touch. Notice how this is complex phrasing. We are not just saying, I'm sorry, I wasn't talking to you. Okay, but I'm making up for it via this letter. Again, complex phrasing. You have a semicolon, which makes the sentence complex because it divides the sentence into two parts, one before semicolon, one after. And then we have at least I hope so. Okay, so this is your introductory greeting. Okay, then you're going to have the three body paragraphs. This is the correct structure you want to use. You need three body paragraphs. Why? Because each body paragraph is going to answer one bullet point. So one bullet point, each bullet gets one body paragraph. Then you finish off with the last paragraph. I'm hoping this letter finds you well. So instead of saying talk to you soon, we're, say, we're using complex, unique sentences. Do get back to me whenever you get a chance. Again, this is not, these are not very advanced words and this is done on purpose. In informal letter writing, if you ever say, I'm looking forward to talking to you, you're going to lose all your points. If you use formal wordings in informal letters, you will lose your points. So we have to keep it informal. And that's why we have this talk to you soon with an exclamation mark. The more exclamation marks you use, the better. In the informal letters, you will get more marks for this, but in the formal letters, you will lose marks because you're not supposed to have expressions in the formal letters. In informal, it actually gives you more marks. So you have your finishing greeting, you have your starting greeting, and the three bullet points, you do not have a template for that because they're always going to be different. 
So just memorize these words. They cover more than 50 words. They do 33% of the work for you. All you got to do is do the three uh, paragraphs in the middle. We have explained how to do these paragraphs in way more detail. You can check out our IELTS course in the description. Everything that is covered in this video, there is a 15 hour lecture on that in the video with mock tests and a lot of secret hidden strategies with sample answers as well. So I highly rec recommend that source. More on that later. One last thing before I finish is at the start, you need a salutation. So other than the paragraphs at the start, you would say, dear name of the friend, and you would finish with best regards and your first name. Okay. First name only for you and first name only for the friend, because this is informal. All right. When we go to, and by the way, there is a sample here. You can pay a uh, pause the video and check it out. We're not going to read it. We have a crash course. So this is a pretty good sample, uses the uh, template perfectly and scores easily 8.5 to 9 bands. Now you can read the formal question here. And once we get into the answer, once again, before I go into the five paragraphs, remember at the start, you would say, dear Mr. or Miss with their last name, because this is a formal letter. You would finish off with yours sincerely this time, yours sincerely. Don't use yours faithfully, it's, it's old now. So you want to use yours sincerely and your full name this time, because it is a formal letter. Okay, once again, you can see a similar structure. You have five body par five paragraphs, including three body paragraphs that are gonna answer the three bullet points in the question, in sequence, by the way. Uh, once again, how to elaborate those bullets, all that great detail is mentioned in our course. Check it out in the description. When people start this, the like 90% of the times our students, they use the words, I'm uh, today I'm writing this letter because you should not use that. You should say the purpose of my writing today is to inform you about unique phrasing, low frequency words and phrases should be used. The first paragraph is always about the purpose. So we have to start with the purpose. There is no greeting here. And those are the words you want to use to start with your purpose. The finish is this. There's two versions of this. I'm looking forward to seeing how my suggestions translate into prompt actions from your side. Your kind cooperation would be most appreciated. You use this when you are having a question which is asking you to give suggestions. So a lot of questions in IELTS ask you to uh, point out some problems and give some suggestions. In that case, this first part, the first sentences are perfect use them. They're complex phrasing. They are unique words and sentences that we're using here. But in a different case, if it's not about giving suggestions and you just want to finish up with something like, I'm looking forward to talking to you, do not say I'm looking forward to talking to you because that is something that everybody is going to say. You will not score a high mark with that. Instead, you're going to finish with your cooperation in this matter is greatly appreciated. Uh, furthermore, an open line of communication from your side in this case would greatly help out. Okay. So in our course, in our detailed course, we break down why each one of these things is important. But just to give you an overview of why these words and sentences score so many marks is because the first of all, the phrasing is very unique. Instead of us saying the common stuff, we're saying uh, an open line of communication from your side instead of saying I'm looking forward to talking to you. Now, when we say stuff like furthermore, you have a mark for a connector cohesion. You're getting your marks there. Uh, greatly is an adverb. So that is going to give you marks for the range of vocab. When you put from your side in between commas, you have complex punctuation because you're separating that from the rest of the sentence. You have greatly again. So again, you have the Lee and overall it's a perfect finish as well without grammar mistakes or anything. So go ahead and copy these templates for task one, formal and infor informal writing. There is a sample answer here. You can again, pause the video if you would like. Okay next part and the next part and here's the finish great so that is the template for task one let's look at the template for task two now before we do that there are seven main types of questions in task two task two also scores more marks than task one so 66 percent marks are dependent on task two and the rest of them go to task one which means here is where you have to score if you pass a failed exam it's it depends on this answer. So before we look into the template, let's look into the types of questions we're going to talk about. Type one is discuss both sides. Now here you need to have three bodies. All right. When I say bodies, 
it does not include intro and conclusion. So there's intro, bodies, and conclusion. So if you have three bodies here, it's going to be total five paragraphs with the intro and conclusion. Now, we're going to discuss this one in a lot of detail, so I will leave that for now. Uh, question type two is direct question. This also needs three bodies. Now, three bodies for direct questions, it's something like this. A direct question would ask you two separate questions. You can again pause the video and read it. What you would do here is you would do your intro, conclusion, and in every task to question, in the intro we have our opinion, and in conclusion we're rephrasing our opinion. Now when you look at the first question, if you want, you can do two bodies here and one body here. Or you can do one body here and two bodies here. Either way is fine, okay? That's how you put the three bodies. Let's go into the simple questions. They are, what is your opinion? To what extent do you agree? Do you, what do you think? Very common questions, right? Here, just do two bodies, and I highly recommend stick to one option. We have seen time and time again, students, when they pick one side, of course, in the opinion, but they talk about that side only in body one and in body two, they score more than students who talk about both sides, like body one, one side, body two, the other. So pick one side and just defend that in the body paragraphs. You will thank me later. You will score more marks that way. Do the advantages outweigh the disadvantages? This question requires three bodies as well. Again, this is the question type. They give you a scenario and at the end they ask you, do you think advantages outweigh the disadvantages? If you pick in your opinion that advantages outweigh disadvantages, you need two bodies on advantages and one body on the disadvantage. That's it. Makes sense as well, right? Your opinion needs more, to, uh, more words to emphasize that. So three bodies go here. And by the way, a common confusion here, yes, you do need your opinion if you're doing the outweigh question. Right after that, we look at the advantages and disadvantages question where they don't ask you what outweighs what. They just ask you what are the advantages and disadvantages of something. Here, you just need two bodies. Advantages go in body one, disadvantages go in body two. Problems and solutions, this is the type of question. Two problems in body one, two problems in body, two solutions in body two. Okay, and causes and effects, again, two bodies, two causes in body one, two effects in body two. That's it. So the last three types of questions, advantages, problems, and causes, they're descriptive questions. Here, you do not need an opinion. You should not give an opinion here. And in all these three questions, you are giving two bodies. All right. Now, with that said, we are going to discuss the first type of question. And I put this here because this is a common confusion among many students. Discuss both sides should have three bodies. Why? Because two is okay. You will score maybe seven with that. But if you're looking to score eight or nine, which should be your aim, you should have something that creates excitement and uniqueness with your writing. It should stand out. It should not be like everybody else. And these templates show you exactly how to do that. Okay. So once again, check out the question, pause the video, read it. And here in our template, we discuss the exact words and phrases you should use to execute a perfect seven band plus essay. So we start with the discussion of, put the topic here. All right. So we have an example here, as you can see, the discussion of technology in this question, you put the topic there is surely one that begs the question of exactly. So it's surely one that begs the question of, and here you put the question that we're thinking begs the question of exactly how it creates a larger divide among various income groups. Okay, it is so much fancier than just saying this is a hot topic of debate, which a lot of students would say. Your first general sentence is very complex, followed by in my opinion, due to and this is important because with due to you have to give reasons like due to economic reasons, due to political reasons or something. Whatever these reasons are, you're going to elaborate them in the body paragraphs. So it's important to not just say your opinion, but give reasons why. And then you explain supporting tech growth will be the most apropos choice. Apropos, fancy word, and means appropriate. Okay. Right away, your first impression blows away the examiner. It has a lot of complex phrasing and words, and it's very unique. Okay. Then we go in our body paragraph one, which is paragraph two in total. Here you put one point, you say one clear fact is that, and by, there's an example coming up so you can check it out later. 
Here, you put your topic sentence, one clear fact is that, and put the main point here. Define it here using words like take, for instance. If you want to explain more, to illustrate further and keep going, and then hence is your concluding sentence. Perfect flow and great connective sentences, perfect template to use. Remember, it's discussed both sides. So now we say nevertheless, instead of saying a basic word like however, and now, now we're going to pick the topic sentence on the other side. We're going to say, but you know, this other point has this benefit. This can be understood when considering and this considering adds another layer of the sentence, making the sentence complex where you're going to explain this further, put a semicolon and now say, therefore, a semicolon is going to give you marks for advanced punctuation. Therefore, it's a concluding word and then the last part of your sentence. Notice it's not a new sentence. It's the same sentence. And we are adding this variation again to show the examiner that we are able to and we get marks for that range. When you go to paragraph four, which is your body three, you say overall, again, good connection. I still opine that repeat your opinion here in just one sentence. Now you say another reason stems from the fact that explain one side, nonetheless, explain the other side. There you go. This is the most beautiful structure that examiners are going to fall in love with because in body three, you discuss both things while in body one and two, you discuss one point in total. You have discussed four points, two on each side while keeping unique words and phrases at your core. Last paragraph to conclude both sides present strong arguments. You need a combination of simple and complex sentences. So we have a simple sentence here. However, and now you rephrase your opinion here at the ending, you can put a suggestion. It is optional, but it's a suggestion like someone should do something. The government should do something or whatever based on your topic. I check out a sample. Check it out here. This is exactly how we have used the words and phrases. Feel free to pause the video if you need to. Okay. You can see how the template beautifully covers all the words, makes it look extremely fancy and covers everything range of vocab, um, the grammar mistake proof version that you need and the connection, cohesion, task response, everything just looks wonderful. So this is how we teach our students templates. And this is the first version of discuss both sides. You can use a lot of words and phrases from here in other seven types of questions as well. However, to find out or to see the entire list of templates as well as sample answers, plus in depth explanation, you got to check out our course in the description. That is where we can cover it in a lot of detail because in one hour we cannot. However, I hope this helps you in realizing the level you need for IELTS writing and the words and phrases that you can copy paste in any other type of question as well. It is highly advisable, however, to look at the accurate templates. So feel free to check out the course in the description. We're now going to get to speaking. IELTS speaking is again a module where everybody fails after writing. So here's a few things we need to do to improve that. First of all, you got three parts, parts one, two, and three. All right. Part one is where they ask you personal questions. Uh, what's your favorite color? Where do you work? Do you have a lot of friends, etc. Part two is the cue card where you give, you get a topic, you got to speak on it for two minutes. And part three is general questions, not related to your personal life, but more about the world, politics and news and so on. Now here is the magic strategy right in front of you in parts one and three, two long points or three short points. As long as you do this, you will have no issues getting good answers because most of the times the examiner can easily say, well, this student did not cover the task response. He or she did not speak too much or too little, or they were not explaining everything in depth. So if I focus on two long points or three short points, this problem completely goes away. While doing this, I also have to use really good temp of uh, vocabulary, phrases, adjectives, use a range, use expressions and examples. So I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. All right. And what do I exactly mean by two long points or three short points? Let's look at a question here. Do you have a lot of friends there? So they're, it's, they're talking about a place. So um, do you have a lot of friends in, for example, my city is Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba, Canada. I'm going to talk about my friends here and I'm going to answer two long points. 
I don't have a lot of friends, to be quite honest. I am a hermit when it comes to social relationships. I just cannot get out of my bubble, which is me and my laptop. Uh, that is just the kind of, kind of lifestyle I have chosen. Regrettably, however, that is the ultimate truth. Moreover, I wouldn't even have the ability or capacity to indulge in social relationships given the nine to nine work life that I have. It is not nine to five. It is in fact a 12 hour daily shift seven days a week, which prevents me from any sort of social life. Okay, guys. So here we have two points. One was I am a hermit. I just cannot go out. I'm awkward socially. The second point was um, that I am always indulged in work. So I explained both points in a lot of detail. You can see I used a lot of complex phrasing, vocabulary, and words. This cannot be taught in one hour, absolutely not. Again, check out our course in the description that gives you the word lists, vocab range, and so on. However, what I wanted to communicate was the two main points that I did. I also separated them, I think with a connector, I'm not sure what connector I used, but you could clearly see I was separating those two points. Now I could also make three points and notice how I'm gonna shift from one to other to the third point. Do you have a lot of friends there? Actually, I don't have a lot of friends. I can't because I'm working too much. Moreover, even if I do, I would just be socially awkward because I'm just that kind of a socially anxious person. Furthermore, if I do, it would have been great, but I just don't see a lot of cons in, or sorry, pros in having friends, which is why I'd rather not, okay? So in this case, I got three points, short points, separated with connectors, but also explained with a variety of vocabulary, being descriptive, giving examples. Notice in the third point, I said cons instead of pros, and I confidently said sorry, I mean pros, and went on. Whenever you make mistakes, just say sorry, pardon me, and go on. Native speakers do that too. So if you do that, as long as you confidently handle it, all good, okay? So two long points or three short points is the strategy for parts one and parts three. I would suggest using a lot of adjectives and adverbs. Adjectives are qualities, good, bad, sad, happy. Uh, adverbs are these, how you define a verb. Okay, so they are quickly, slowly, nicely, and, and those leads that you need to use. Use connectors, furthermore, likewise, moreover, also, whenever you are connecting your points, and use descriptions, paint a picture, all right, how I was explaining that I would just not be able to talk to them, I am anxious, so you know I'm using a lot of adjectives, anxious, hermit, awkward, uh, and give examples. You can even say, for example, you don't always need to say, for example, you can just explain the scenario, but you can say, for example, and elaborate on that further. I would recommend doing a lot of practice with this, going to different speaking tests and doing exactly what I did. With each question, do two long points or three short points. Whatever works for you is okay, but I prefer people do two long points because it's usually hard to think about three short points uh, and it's easier to explain the two. Now, one thing is, what happens when the examiner stops you? Nothing at all, okay? If the examiner stops you, at no point are they reducing your marks, so don't worry about that. Talking about examiner expressions, if they are giving you a hard time or they're making weird faces at you, it's a good sign, okay? They do this with speakers who are really advanced. If you're really talented, you speak really well, they're gonna try to challenge you. And when they do, they're gonna cut you off, they're gonna interrupt you, they're gonna make a weird face at you because they are challenging you. So just ignore them, just focus on the answers, okay? And if they're encouraging you, that also might mean both things. It might mean you're good or bad, it could depend on the examiner themselves. Again, if they're stopping you, it's not a bad thing. So make sure you keep doing your two long points or three short points, all right? When it comes to part two, and if they stop you, that's fine. You should be able to speak over two minutes. Make sure you cover everything in two minutes, but you never know when the time is supposed to finish. You're supposed to finish between one minute, 45 seconds to two minutes. So you, you don't have a watch in front of you. So your best bet here is to keep talking, and if they stop you, perfect. Let's talk about the cue card, okay. In the cue card, we need to make sure we have two points each. We work with IELTS examiners. Here are the things they say. One examiner says, I want students to focus most on the last point. Don't talk about the first three most, but much or at the end, just talk about the last one. I want details there, okay? The other examiner says, I want details on everything. 
okay? And there are multiple versions here. But if you're able to give details on every bullet point, no examiner will complain. And that is the best strategy you can use. So you get a cue card here. In the preparation time, my best advice is don't write down anything. Nine out of 10 times, the things you write down, you don't even look at them when you're speaking because you're trying to be natural and you should be natural. There's also the time stress, the examiner stress. People don't look at their notes, so don't write anything, please. In the preparation time, just think of two points per topic. You might not even remember them when you start, but at least you'll get some ideas and you will remember most of them, okay? When you start speaking, start with two points, two points, two points. And what I mean by this is, for example, the question says, describe the word friendship. So the first question is what it means to you. I'm gonna have my two points here. Friendship is someone who, a friend of someone who could be there for my bad times. And it's someone who I would love to be there for in their bad times. So that's two points here. How it looks or appears in everyday life. It could be two points hanging out almost every week. And the second point would be calling each other if you're not hanging out and so on, okay? That's how you can practice brainstorming, by the way, with all the ways I've described to you how to use part one, three, and two points, two points or three points. First of all, that's important. So you can think of things quickly on your toes when you're about to speak in the exam. And uh, again, by doing this, you're covering every question. Just make sure you use good connectors. Again, furthermore, likewise, moreover, those are just the connectors to use when connecting different points. But when it's contradictory, you can also use words like however, nevertheless, nonetheless. When it's conclusion, you can use words like overall, thus, more, sorry, therefore, hence, and thereby. You can also use uh, complex sentences, which unfortunately we cannot cover in this course because it's short. It's more in detail in our course in the description, but complex sentences would be, just to give you a brief overview, would be sentences that divide the sentence into two parts. So it would be something like considering. Considering I haven't eaten today, then the next part would be, I'm gonna start immediately cooking, okay? Considering breaks down the sentence into two parts. Think about although, although I am tired, I'll still keep working, okay? So anything like that, considering, although, due to, because, concerning, given that, based on, all these words, when you use them at the start of sentences, they first of all connect the whole speaking, but they also make the sentence complex. And by the way, you can use this for writing as well. In the templates in writing, you already have the complex sentences. So the template version I showed you, it already has a lot of that. But you can use this trick to use complex sentences, have a flow and have a variation than just using the connectors. Because examiners and IELTS love variation, they love a range and students hate that because students don't use that. So if you're able to use it, you're able to score great marks, okay? We also have speaking templates, just like writing templates, but they are too detailed to explain in this course. They are again in the link in the description, but make sure with the points, with the examples I have given and with the range and the examiner criteria I have explained, you practice your speaking that way as well. Now we'll move on to listening. Listening in IELTS is generally an easier module, but that's why a lot of times in people's express entry profiles or immigration schemes, you're required to get a score of eight in listening and seven in others, which makes listening now more difficult. Uh, but there are ways and strategies with different question types that you can easily tackle this. So let's get into it. And we're gonna discuss every single question type here. And I'm gonna tell you towards the end why a lot of people who score eight bands in classes score six and a half in the exam, how that happens. So let's get into all those tips and tricks right now. Uh, part one is easy, okay? And by this, at the start of part one, they're going through a lot of instructions. If you have done the exam before, you know that you don't have to listen to all those instructions. They're the same every time. Instead, you can just go down and start looking at the questions, okay? When you have these types of questions, fill in the gap questions, which you will definitely have at some part in the exam, two things you gotta do predict and look at the keywords. Predict and look at the keywords. For example, if it's a phone number, my keyword is phone number, all right? Number, it could be a cellular number or just your contact number. What I also have done here is I have paraphrased all these 
different versions that they will say. And that's a skill you want to learn as well, because if you can paraphrase it, you will not have an issue catching them when they paraphrase it, because they might use an alternative keyword. So that's one thing. And my prediction for this is, well, it's going to be a number. OK, it's obvious. But why I'm saying this is because if you know it's a number, your brain is going to be on hyper alert as soon as they start talking about numbers. A lot of people are waiting for other words. But if you know it's a number, you're ready to catch it. For example, with the USA address, 509 is a keyword that cannot be paraphrased. So that's a good keyword. But your prediction is an address. So Almond Bay or uh, Varela Crescent. It would be an address. If you hear the words Bay, Crescent, Ash, Boulevard, you're ready to put that right there. OK, something in Seattle, 1137 address again in Seattle, you would know you are predicting this to come and you'd be ready for it. So prediction and looking at keywords is really important. Some of my students get confused with this day and this is a day which means Thursday, Friday and some or something or it could be a day like a national holiday. But they put the date here, which is already mentioned, by the way, which they don't see. But they put that again. That's why it's important to remember it's a day. That's the keyword. So make sure you're looking at the keywords correctly. Uh, when it's time, you're going to look for a, a time. Simple. OK, now let's get into the question seven to ten matching questions and listening. What happens here is again, by the way, in the entire listening, they go in sequence. And sorry, I should have said this before. When you have the listening questions in front of you, if you haven't done IELTS, now you would know the audio is being played at the same time. OK, so that you have the questions in front of you, you do not need to take notes separately. So now with these types of questions, seven to ten, you will have them coming in sequence. They'll first talk about cutlery and dishes, then kettle and so on. So it's easy to follow that. What is not easy is to follow A, B and C, because we don't know if B is going to be here, if C is going to be here. We don't know that. So you would need to read A, B, C in the preparation time. They're just three options. So why do you need to read them is because they'll paraphrase them in the emergency pack. They might say things that I need urgently in personal package, confidential things, confidential documents in storage with, with furniture. Maybe they'll say storage with furniture, but they could also say your essentials or the requirements you have for your drawers, uh, cabinets and so on. They might not even say the word furniture. OK, so it's important to paraphrase them. It's important to look at all of them when you are preparing. And when you're listening, you look at seven and wait for the word eight, wait for the word and so on. OK, so you can always control the numbers because, you know, they're going to be in sequence. But the lists that don't have numbers next to them, make sure you read all of them in the preparation time and keep your eyes on the paraphrasing. As you advance, you have four sections. This is section one that we just did. Section two, three and four. The sections will get more and more difficult with section four being the worst. OK, so we're right now in section two. And if you get this kind of question, it's a blessing. You're lucky because tables always go left to right, left to right. So you would have them say 9 a.m. first, then the things about the content, then location, then again, time, this and this. So it's going to be in this sequence, which means you know where to move your eyes. OK, now here. Again, it's matching. Sorry, it's fill in the gaps. So you have to predict the answer and you have to look at the keywords. Be careful with questions like these 11 and 12. They're so close together when they did this one. If you have done this uh, speak, sorry, listening, they said it in this way. The title of this le today's lecture is going to be about something covered by John Smith from the University of whatever. So it was said so fast in one breath. When questions are this close, be sure to Pay attention. Now we see a little break here. Uh, so that means you have you can relax. You can watch them say all of this. But then 13, 14, very close together. They might say everything in one sentence here quickly as well. And then you have a little break and then you have 15. So you can kind of see how the flow goes. But be careful because when it came to question 16, they said the time first, then they answered 16 and then they said is going to be at the informal reception. So it's slightly out of sequence, which you can expect slightly. It can be out of sequence, which means you should be always ready and alert. But it's not going to be like uh, 15 is going to come before 16. It's not going to be that out of sequence. When we go down, we see our multiple choice questions. I will get to the multiple choice strategy later because this one is relatively easier. So we'll look in that at that in a second. Oh, actually, we have it right here. So now we're in section three. 
this is where before we discuss multiple choice strategy, one thing you got to keep in mind is now you got to look at two questions at a time. Remember earlier I said people who score eight bands in their tests, they score like in practice tests at home, they score six and a half in the exam. Why? Because they're looking at question 21, but the examiner moves on to 22 and 23 and so on. And the person student is stuck at 21. They never knew when they moved on. This is worse in part four, because in part four, there is no break. Like they don't stop after three or four questions, 31 to 40 go at the same time. I had one student, he was so heartbroken. This happened in a real life scenario to my student. He was stuck at 31, did not read 32, never realized when they moved to 32 and onward, and he failed listening, obviously. So if he had read, read 31 and 32 together, he would not have missed 32. Maybe he missed 31, but as soon as 32 was set, he would have continued from there. At least the other nine would have a good chance, right? From section three onwards, you got to start reading two questions at a time because it will get fast and you might miss some of the words. Now, here is one way you can prevent that. Read multiple choice questions in the preparation time, only the questions. Do not read the multiple choice options, okay? Simple. If you read the multiple choice answers, there are 66% incorrect answers. Obviously, if you're looking at A, B, and C, B is correct, for example. A and C are just wasting your time and confusing you. Plus, if you read all those things and the listening starts, you won't remember anything. You won't be able to focus on anything because you have read too much. But instead, if in the preparation time you just read the question, you will know the keywords of the question itself. The first question says, what is the defining characteristic of a specialized course? So I'm looking at the word characteristic, specialized course. I'm thinking about, all right, the main idea of the specialized course or the central important thing of the specialized course or the main essence of the specialized course. They might not even say a specialized course. They might say a skill-based course, a specific course, a degree course, uh, and so on. So you, you can see what I'm doing in my pre preparation time is I'm reading the keywords but I'm also paraphrasing them in my head. Very important strategy because if you don't do it, they certainly will. And if you have paraphrased it, you will hear some of those words that you already have in your head. You're not just relying on the exact words, but you're relying on the concept. Remember that, okay? So we look at those uh, questions only. Now, when the listing starts, we are ready. We fully know the things that we are looking for, okay? Now you have to multitask. You have to read all the options. When you're looking at 21, they're talking about that. Look at options A, B, C and listen at the same time. Here, one quick thing you can do is look at one keyword at least from each option. So this is talking about a proficiency exam. This is talking about frequent class, attending the classes frequently. So it should be about attendance. This is about something that is compulsory and regular. So those requirements. If they talk about anything related even similar to, for example, be on time in class, I'm looking at B, okay? And then I'm, I'm gonna keep my eye on A and C because I love to eliminate the points. I'm not gonna be happy if I just hear B and hear nothing about A and C. Usually they will mention something about A and C and that's how I would know I could eliminate them. But I'm looking at B right now because they mentioned something close to it. So my finger is there, my pencil is there, my mouse is there. And as soon as they talk about others, I'm looking at them too. And those keywords that I read are helping me locate which one is which. But here's the thing. A lot of times they would say the right thing that is mentioned. But remember, we're looking for the defining char characteristic of a specialized course. That's why you read the question first to understand what the specialized course requires and will answer something relevant to that. This is, again, important because when people don't focus on the question, they're focused too much on the options. They just focus on the options. They forget what the question is asking. That's why I mentioned, make sure to read the question first and options during listening. Okay, that's that. Let's go down into our next type of question. Uh, 30, we have already covered, it's fill in the gap question, but something like 27 to 29, it's saying which three compulsory courses must be taken? Could be any three from this list. It will not be in sequence most likely, okay? So they might say, uh, for example, computing is compulsory, but medical science, you can ignore it. So computing, 
there you go, that's your answer. It could go in any sequence. Now what you should do here in this case is make sure you paraphrase the word compulsory. They might say compulsory, required, mandatory, important, okay? And look out for tricks. For example, they might say statistics and medicine were not compulsory until last year, now they are. Okay, so they usually do that, trying to first show you that it's not compulsory and, and you then ignore that. And the next sentence is, but you know, now they are. So be careful with that very common IELTS technique as well. Okay, uh, this is part four. Again, the same types of questions. We know what to do here. They are fill in the gap questions. You predict what's gonna uh, come here. For example, this one, you can easily predict they are numbers. So we're putting, putting numbers here and looking at the keywords next to them, okay? However, in this type of question, I always make students practice this. And in our course, in the description, you can see how we have covered every type of question. I have answered them in detail with explanations, each question. So you can see what exactly happens in the exam. But here, um, when my students were looking for something like 32, before being used, material undergoes. It should be material undergoes, right? It should be something like uh, goes through or the process involves or something. None of those wor words were used. And it was, the, I think the answer was cutting. And they said that uh, cutting is re required to uh, help the material do whatever. It's none of the keywords are even paraphrasing, nothing close to that, but it's something just completely different. However, in the preparation time, if you have done a good job of understanding the concept, you won't have an issue. So the concept in 32 would be, before being underused, the material undergoes. So what does it undergo? Okay, just think about what happens to the material. What kind of process would take place? Polishing, cleaning, uh, wrapping, whatever. As long as you know something happens to the material and they don't use the same words or phrases, you will still be able to get the answer. So make sure when it goes to part four, your paraphrasing game is a little bit more advanced. It's not just thinking that the words here or something even close would come to that. It could be something very, very different, okay? But the concept would be the same. Something undergoes, so the material goes through a process. It has to be some sort of process. As long as you understand the, those core terminologies, you will be okay with this part. But practice a lot here because part four really challenges our students. Okay, now on to reading. One important thing we do in our reading classes with general students is we make them practice the academic reading. There is no difference in terms of the format when it comes to the types of questions, true, false, not given, matching questions, and so on. They're the exact same. The only difference is the difficulty level, which is exactly why we make them do the academic reading. If you can do a good job in the academic reading, you will not have an issue with the general reading. So if in our classes you score six and a half bands in the academic reading, in the general exam, you're going to score seven or seven and a half easily. Okay, so we're going to look at this academic reading with the same types of questions you get in general reading, uh, first starting with list of headings, and we're going to go with every question type and discuss the strategy because any teacher who tells you do this for reading, it's not a good strategy because every type of question is different, okay? So we look at the first type of question, list of headings, and in this, you got to look at uh, the paragraphs down below, read them, come back and match them with the heading. Uh, one failed strategy that people use is they look at question number one in the list of headings, this question here. Then they look at all the paragraphs and then they look at question two and so on. This is a terrible strategy. Please don't do that. Instead, what you want to do first is read all the headings. Read all the headings. Look at the keywords in each heading, okay? So I'm looking, looking at words like early years of Gilbert. So I'm thinking also in terms of paraphrasing uh, when he was born. Maybe they're going to use that terminology or the first uh, days of Gilbert. Uh, what was new about a scientific research method? So it could be something revolutionary about the method or it could be something um, groundbreaking about science and so on. So I'm reading all the questions. By paraphrasing, I'm going to be able to catch anything similar that is mentioned and also i'm learning them i'm memorizing them by paraphrasing i'm looking at different angles i'm imagining those uh, words and phrases and when it comes to the paragraphs even if they're paraphrased or even if the answer is all the way down here somewhere i would still remember the questions 
which is the beauty of paraphrasing uh, with a long list of questions like the one we just saw. So when we look at all the questions, we're going to go down here, paragraph A, read it, come back and match. Then paragraph B, read it, come back and match. When you're matching, you're looking for the main idea in each paragraph. Okay, it's a heading question. So if you find one thing in this line that was mentioned, it's not enough, it should be the main idea. So make sure the whole paragraph is talking about that. 80% of the times, the answers for a list of headings are in the first few sentences of the paragraph. 20% of the times, they are in the last few sentences. So that's a strategy you can use as well. But that's also a strategy that examiners use to confuse you. Sometimes they put some, something very easy at the start, making you think that that is the answer, but you have to read the whole paragraph to make sure that is the one. So don't always listen to that. Just make sure you look at the whole paragraph. But in case you're in a rush, you could always look at the first few sentences to get the answer for the list of headings. Alrighty, let's go down and look at our next type of question, true, false, not given. This is a very confusing question, and I'm going to tell you one thing you can thank me for a million times because the biggest confusion is understanding the difference between false and not given. If you can understand this, you can ace any reading attempt. False, guys, is anything that is opposite to the question. Okay, opposite to the question. So the question says, eight, he is less famous than he should be. The opposite of this is he is more famous than he should be, or he's way more popular than he deserves. That's the opposite. If you find that, it's false. But if the, uh, the passage says his fame was not uh, mentioned in any of the old literature. So now students get really confused because his fame was not mentioned, does it mean he is less famous? Then it's true, but it's not the opposite, so what is it? Well, it's not given, because it's not the same thing, it's not the opposite, so it's not given, okay? As long as you can remember this, you will not have an issue with this. It's the most confusing type of question, but remember, false is only the opposite of the question. If it's not the opposite, it's not given, okay? Strategy you want to use is look at them in sequence. True, false, not given questions are usually in sequence. Uh, they could be slightly out of sequence, a sequence, which means nine may come before eight, but it's very, very unlikely that 10 will come before eight. Okay. And by that, I mean eight, nine, 10. You should be able to find them in the passage, but it could also be nine, eight, 10. All right. So slightly out of sequence. Is something you can expect. When it comes to this one, choose three letters, three of these A to F that are parts of Gilbert's discovery. This was a very entertaining question because uh, first of all, what you got to do is you have to read A to F. You have to look at the keywords there, paraphrase them, just like I did with the list of headings, and now you have understood them. We got to find three of them in the paragraphs. So it, it was interesting because Almost every student made a mistake here. Um, let's go read this part. Early beliefs were entangled with superstitions such as rubbing garlic on lodestone can neutralize its magnetism. Okay, so if I see this part, garlic can remove magnetism. I'm gonna say, well, that's the answer. But no, if I read that, it said early superstitions. So it's not something that was Gilbert's discovery. The question is asking me about Gilbert's discovery. So this answer was wrong. Most people answered that, okay? So then you gotta keep reading and make sure you only find three things for Gilbert's discovery. Again, uh, if there is a trick question like this, it's likely it's not gonna be mentioned again, so you can remove that. And garlic is supposedly not an important thing, so it won't be mentioned again, but it could be. So you can say, you can put a little cross here in the exam, but keep in mind this might be repeated and keep listening or keep reading, sorry, in this case. Eventually you'll find three. One other thing is wherever you found true, false, not given, for example, up to question 10, if you found the answers in paragraph D, then after paragraph D is where you will find the answers for 11 to 13 because even the sets of questions are in sequence usually, okay? Um, just things like the list of headings 
and matching questions, which we'll look at in a second, are not in sequence. Those can be anywhere. Alrighty, as soon as you go to passage two and so on, things are gonna get more and more difficult, just like in listening. It becomes harder as you go. Uh, true, false, not given, we have discussed this already. It starts at 14 to 19, which means, again, this is the first question of passage two. You can be confident slightly that you should be able to find the answers at the start and go down from there. I say slightly confident because you never know, sometimes they can be out of sequence, but it's very likely you should go at the very start to find the first answer and so on. However, it is section two. And yes, we are talking about general reading. From section two onwards, it's a very good strategy to look at two questions at a time, just like we started doing that in listening as the sections advanced, because you might miss 14 easily. But if you look at 14, 15 together, you're gonna be able to find 15 maybe, not 14. You answer 15 first and then go back and check why you missed 14, okay? Sometimes also the answer could be not given, which could be very confusing. If you're trying to find 14, it's not given, you wasted the whole passage and now you're gonna go to 15. If you just had read 14 and 15 together, you would have discovered 15 first, which meant 14 was not given and you could move on quicker, okay? So start reading two questions at a time. Okay, this one, when it's the answer of no more than two words or no more than three words, you gotta fill in the blanks or you simply have to give an answer in two or three words. What you gotta do is make sure you look at, again, keywords, two things, keywords and prediction. Same thing we did in listening, okay? In this case, what are the two hottest years in Britain besides 2003? So prediction is obvious. It has to be a number, two years, right? 1990 to 1800, etc. And your uh, keyword here is Britain. Keywords are years. And besides 2003, well, 2003 is the whole passage, so it's not really a keyword. But yeah, you got to look for Britain. It's, it cannot be paraphrased, Britain. Uh, maybe they're going to say the English people, but Britain most likely will be there. And something about years is going to be there too. Why this is so key is because later, when you see question 22, it also says the other two hottest years around the globe were, okay? So for each question, one, one has the answer here, 1998 and 2002. The other had the answer here, 1976 and 1995. So one pair would be the answer for question 20. One pair would be the answer for question 22. And my students, mostly complicate this. They confuse and mix both. And then I remind them, you did not follow the strategy. The strategy tells you, look at the keywords. If you look at the keywords here, it's two hottest years in Britain. Here it's two hottest years around the globe. That's your go-to, that's your strategy. If you looked at that keyword, you wouldn't have an issue finding which answer belongs to what, okay? So make sure you look at the keywords predicted as well, they are usually in sequence too. This type of question, which of the following can be described as the title of the passage? It's best you do this at the end. In this case, the question came at the end, which is perfect, but in some cases they put this question at the start, but if they do, just do other questions, come back to it later, okay? And at the end, you would have read everything, you would have a good idea. If you look at options A, B, C, you see the word global warming mentioned there. And you would really think it has to be something like global warming because it's mentioned so much. But in fact, the answer is D. So this can be their strategy to confuse you. Be careful with that too. Um, it doesn't have to be the, the most obvious thing. There's a, sometimes put it to confuse you. But also look at the answer D, the hot year in Europe. If you look at the heading of the passage, it says the 2003 heat wave. If you simply paraphrase it, it's the hot year in Europe, right? So you can also look at the actual initial heading of the passage to get the answer for something like this. All right, let's go to passage three. It is the hardest passage and these questions are provided to you in our course in the mock test. I've also gone over uh, all of them and answered them showing you how to fetch answers quickly and easily. So you can check that out always in the description. Here we have the next type of question, matching questions. This is a very difficult question and it's almost a curse if you get this in part three because it's gonna take a long time to answer. It's gonna be very difficult. And here, the problem is you gotta read everything. And not only the questions, I mean literally everything in the passage because this is not a matching heading question like the one we did above. This is you know, matching sentences, matching this, this word, like the definition of phonology in 27. 
maybe this is mentioned in this line right here. Maybe it's mentioned here. We, we don't know where it's mentioned. It's not the heading. It's just in any part of the paragraph. But don't worry, we have a strategy for that. First, we're going to look at all the questions again, because these types of questions, headings, matching, and matching uh, sentences are questions that are in uh, out of sequence. They could be anywhere. So we're going to look at all questions 27 to 33. We're going to paraphrase the keywords as well. So when we go to the passage, if they mention synonyms, we will be able to find them. Once we read the questions, we're going to go to paragraph A, read it, understand it, come back down and match it and so on with BCD. I want to show you something really interesting here. Look at question 27, the, the definition of phonology. So you would be really thinking it's got to be, you know, somewhere where the definition is mentioned or something. The answer was in paragraph B, but I'd like you to see how they started. They said, B, uh, today such records are being put to uses that their authors could not possibly have expected. These data sets and others like them are proving invaluable to ecolog ecologists interested in the timing of biological events or phenology. So they said our phenology, which means everything before the sentence, before or, is the definition of phenology. This is the only place where they explain da 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 or phenology, or in other words, it's phenology. So that is the definition of phenology. It's not said that this is the definition, it's just said in a highly paraphrased way. But if you keep a few things in mind, you know, it's the definition of phonology. It has to be mentioned the very first time the word phonology is mentioned, right? That is paragraph B was that part. And you're not looking for words like the definition of phonology is, but you're looking for phonology explained again. So keep in mind the paraphrasing or the concept because it could be a high level paraphrasing. Uh, again, matching, sorry, fill in the gap questions. We know what to do here. Uh, but one thing I'll say is when you are answering questions like these, matching questions where you have to read everything, mix them with other types of questions because you will be reading so many things, you will take up so much of your time just for 27 to 33, you will sacrifice other questions. So a very smart strategy is you look at 27 to 33, you're going to the pa passages trying to answer, just keep 34 in your mind, just keep Walter Coates in your mind, just keep 35, Robert Marsham in your mind, just one or two questions. So if you are reading this and all of a sudden you see Walter Coates, you see Robert Marsham, where is that? It's somewhere here. There you go. You know you can answer the other questions too. And at the same time, answer whatever question it needs to be for a paragraph A. So that way you save a lot of time. Okay. Multiple choice questions, a very similar strategy that we had in listening. Look at the question only. Don't look at the options because three out of the four options are wrong. So we're going to look at the question. We're going to first try to find the answer ourselves for that, not looking at the multiple choice questions. When we find the answer in the passage, we come back down and then look at the options and match. Okay, something like this where it starts, uh, fin finishes, sorry, at 40. It is supposed to be in sequence, so you could start from 40, go from the bottom of the passage towards the top, and that's where you can find the sequence. That is another strategy you can use with multiple choice question or any question that is in sequence. Lastly, I want to talk about matching questions like these. These are not paragraph matching, but matching A, B, C. It could be a longer list as well, and matching them with 10 to 13. Once again, 10 to 13 are going to be in sequence, which means 10 and 11, once again, looking at two questions at a time, I will find them first in the passage somewhere here, 10, 11, and uh, then 12, 13, and so on. So first, I'm going to see what the inner corners of eyebrows raised implies. Myself, I'm going to find that myself, and then I'm going to see if it matches with sadness, anger, happiness. Then I'm going to look at do the same for 11, and so on. Again, A, B, C could be so badly paraphrased because sadness could be depression, gloomy, upset, so many words. So be careful and look out for paraphrased words. Uh, reading and listening will give you that as the biggest challenge. So make sure you use the source.com often or you develop a good vocabulary uh, practice in our course, which is in the description. Again, check it out. We provide you with 800 words you need to learn for IELTS. We have a one hour vocab lesson dedicated to just improving your vocabulary because it's super important, as you can see for all the four modules. So feel free to check it out. 
And that is the end of our reading section as well, as well as the entire video. I hope you liked everything. If you have your exam tomorrow, this is by far the best resource you have seen. It's going to prepare you uh, even if you have the time, the exam in the next hour. And if you did like this video, please like, share and subscribe. I hope you found value and I hope you have an amazing exam. If you have any questions for us, our email is always in the description. Best of luck and talk to you soon.